GLC presents a Studio B production brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for the opportunity to share the beauty of the Hebrew language with every one of you. Today, I would like to go to Deuteronomy 6.4, which is probably the most important declaration of um, the Jewish believer in God, the God of Israel, declaring, Hear, O Israel, our God, God is one. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And let me read it for you in the Hebrew. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha bechol levavcha uvechol nafshecha uvechol meodecha. Ve'hayu hadvarim ha'elu asher anochi metzavcha hayom al levavcha ve'shinantam levanecha ve'dibarta bam ve'shivtecha bevetecha uvelechtecha baderech uvesachvecha uvekumecha. וקשרתם לאות על ידיך, והיו לתותפות בין עיניך, וכתבתם על מזוזות ביתך ובשעריך. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. Take to heart these instructions with which I charge you this day. I impress them, I, I'm, oh, impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away and when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol of your, on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorstops of your house and on your gates. Now you could see my hesitation when I was reading the English because the translation was a little bit different from what I was used from another translation that I'm using and it kind of startled me to see words that are different from what I'm using. But that's the nature of translation. You have 10 books, you have 10 ver versions, and they could be a variety of, of translations of the same thing. And that, that is the problem in, in the translation. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that uh, it starts with Shema Israel. Shema means hear. And you would ask yourself a question, why this most important declaration starts with hear, O Israel? Why not listen? Isn't it important enough that uh, you would ask full attention? It's like, listen, you people. But it says hear. Now, what is hearing? I can sit in my room, and a truck would go out down the highway, and I can hear it. I have no control over that. The sound wave will come over and hit my eardrum, and I can hear things. It doesn't mean that I relate to it in any way. Hearing is just opening myself up to sound waves to come and hit my head. That's basically what it is. So why is God saying, hear, O Israel, and not something more um, conclusive, something that will put you in att at attention. The reason of it is that according to the Hebrew tradition, if a person just opens himself up to the Torah, just listen to it, just read it. Don't go with high expectations. Don't say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Just listen. If you open yourself the Torah itself will go in and start doing its work. The values and the morals that are embedded in this text will do the work. And you will 
elevate yourself level by level by level, small step by small step, by just opening yourself up, by repetition, by just being there. I think um, Woody Allen said once, 95% of success is just showing up. And talent and all the others is just the other 5%. So the same thing works here. Just be there. Just hear. If you hear, things start to happen. If you're not there, if you're not hearing, then nothing is going to happen no matter what your intention is. Because you're not there. So hear, O Israel. It's interesting that um, in the New Testament, in Mark 12, 29, Jesus is asked, what is the most important thing to, that a person can do? And he recites exactly what I just recited for, to you. The same verse, the whole thing. From Shema Yisrael ve'ahavta, and you shall love your God, and all the way to your door, door, stop, door post. Um, everything is there. Why? Because this is important. It's a declaration of faith. It's a declaration that you recognize that there is one God and He is responsible for everything. So let me show you the Shema Israel on the board, how it's put together. The spelling of it in the Hebrew goes like this. You see that the ayin at the end, even if you don't know Hebrew, here is a word, all of a sudden you have a letter that is mightily enlarged. In the text, originally, that's the way it is. It's not invented by anybody, anyone. By the way, all of this is lost in the translation because in the translation it's just taking the meaning of what it means, what it is, and writing it in the English language or in, in any other language. In the Hebrew, there are certain phenomena that happen in, in the writing itself that tells you things. So here's Shema. Yisrael. This is an abbreviation for God. The letter He, the fifth letter of the alphabet, with a little tag on top, means the name of God. So we won't have to write the whole name of God. So Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, our God. Again, Adonai. Abbreviation, Echad, one. What did they do? That letter, at the end, the letter Dalit, the fourth letter of the alphabet, is enlarged considerably compared to all the other letters. It's in the text itself, just that way. So, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And obviously, you would ask yourself, what is the significance of those two letters that are enlarged? Why are they enlarged like that? What do they mean? Now, if you take the two letters and you put them next to each other, you have an Ayn and you have a Dalit which is in English, it would be the pronounce ad, okay? Ad means forever. Ad means for eternity. So there is a hint in Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, there is a hint that this is not a declaration for today, it's not a declaration for a period of time. It's a declaration forever. 
this is how the world was created. From our standpoint, for mankind's standpoint, this is forever. For us, this is it. Now, if you reverse the two, if you take the Dalit first and put the I in second, you'll get something like this. And you get the word that is pronounced in transliteration, Da. Da comes from the word Da'at. Knowledge. So what it tells you that you should know this. It it's built in to the sentence. It gives you a hint that this is forever and you should know this. If you, sh if you should know anything from the Bible, if you should know anything from this entire scripture, it will be da, know this. What is it? Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, our God, God is one. So in this one sentence, you have um, all of this play that is hinting and, and giving you more information. This, this is um, an interesting part of how the Hebrew, this, this is an interesting story of how the Hebrew opens up a little bit few more doors for you when you read this in the Hebrew versus reading it in a translation. I want to take you into another story, and we'll find that story in Deuteronomy 5.8. And it's really not a story, it's one of the commandments. In uh, Deuteronomy 5, we are finding the commandments, the Ten Commandments that God is giving the children of Israel. And there is a commandment that um, is the second commandment, and we'll read it in a minute and see what it means. But before we go there, I want to share with you um, a product. It's called The Secrets of the Hebrew Bible. And I would like to invite you to visit the Center for Biblical Hebrew dot com center center for Biblical Hebrew dot com site. You will find them. You will find there a lot of uh, teaching aids and uh, learning tools that will help you to learn more in depth about what Hebrew is and how to use it to study the scriptures how to understand better the Word of God. This particular CDs, um, there are two of them in this pack, and they are a um, condensed version of a seminar on, on the subject of secrets of the Hebrew Bible that I give. And um, it has enormously valuable information about the Torah, about the Hebrew, and um, the secrets, secrets of the Hebrew Bible, that's why we called it that way. The seminar itself is eight hours, and it's condensed to the main points of the seminars are condensed into two hours, and um, you can put it in your car while you're driving and, and listen to it and uh, enjoy it and, and learn something about those important issues. So I would like you to uh, come and visit and like to invite you to the Center for Biblical Hebrew.com site and uh, see this one and, and many other products that will help you. So let's go back to Deuteronomy 5.8. It's the second commandment and um, for those of you who remember the commandments, 
This one has to do with um, don't, you shall not make for yourself a sculpture, sculptured image, any likeness of what is in the heavens above or on the earth below. So it has to do with images. And the question is, why is that so important? Because, of course, today we don't worship sculptures. So if you have a sculpture at home, um, it, it's not a big deal. You're not uh, feeding it. You're not worship, worshiping it. it it's it's an object of beauty that you relate to it as a piece of art. If you have a picture on the wall, people have that all the time, and they don't worship their pictures. So it's, it's not a big deal to us. But let's take a look at what happened 3,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago, and let's figure out if that commandment is still valid for us too. Now, if you recall, you, you look back um, at those years, they didn't have internet, they didn't have radio, television, they didn't have any of those communication tools, they didn't even have books. Everything had to be written down by hand on one uh, one original. There was no duplication. So how did people transfer information? The way people transfer information in most primitive societies or ancient societies was by storytelling. So you'll have a person that is a storyteller and he would sit and people would sit around the campfire, so to speak, and, and uh, the person would... Uh, uh, deliver or convey the story to them. Um, if, if you take, for example, the Iliad by Homer, okay, it took 600 years before it was put down in writing. It was transferred by storytellers from one generation to another. Now, we know what happened when you tell a story and... Um, Another person tells a story, and the person who heard the story tells the story, and by, by the time you go down the road not too far, the story is already completely changed. We know that from, from our own experience. So in ancient times, that tool to transfer information was the main tool. And obviously, it's not accurate. It changes. It doesn't keep the information the way it was conveyed originally, and it has a chance of losing the information, actually, after a while. So storytelling, sculptures, um, panels like we saw in previous programs, the Egyptian pa panels, uh, drawings, uh, paintings, and things like that, those were the main tools for preserving information and transferring it to the next generation. So the Iliad took 600 years to be put in writing. Once it puts in, you put it in writing, you also you, you increase the security of the text because now you have it in writing. But it's not a guarantee because um, the people who will copy it from the original may make mistakes, may edit it, may change it according to their heart's desire. They don't like the story, they tweak the story, okay? According to their political or theological or whatever story is. So there is no guarantee. The only guarantee appeared in, on the Mount Sinai, in, in, during the Mount Sinai event when God is giving the Torah to Moses and that is written down in an original Actually, it was written down by Moses according to tradition 13 times. The first one was put in the Ark of the Covenant, and each one of the tribes received a book. And there was a system of scribes that was put together in order to preserve the text in the original mint condition. The system of scribes. A scribe is a person who is spiritually and physically cleaned, and, and, and um, purified, meditating, sitting down and writing the text, copying the text letter by letter by hand. And this is a system that is still being used today. With all of the advanced technology that we have, 
to write a Torah scroll, a person has to be hired who is of high quality scribe that will sit down. It takes about over a year to write a Torah scroll. By hand, letter by letter. If you make one mistake, you have to start over again or correct the mistake in a specific way that is available. But no letters should touch each other in a very stringent um, rules to help the scribe do a good job. And obviously, over 3,500 years, the text was preserved in the original mint condition. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they are identical to what we have. So we know that at least 2,000 years ago, we had exactly the same text. And we know tradition tells us that it goes back all the way to the original. So this was a major change between the old system that was not secured, the system that was based on storytelling and pictures and sculptures and this and that, that to transfer important information, now there is a new way of doing it. On Mount Sinai, there was a new way invented. So the second commandment actually was designed to preserve this new way of transferring information. This system exists until today, and it lasted in, in fairly good, good condition until about the 15th century. Gutenberg invents the printing press, and at that point, they started to print books. They print books, they print the Bible. One of the first books that was printed was the Bible. And um, the people at that generation, they were looking at the books and they're saying, you know, a whole book, just writing. That's what, how I feel about books. I pick up a book and I look at it, no pictures. What kind of book is that, you know? I, I need some visual to, to hold on to. I, I want to see a face, you know? Talking about a person, I want to see the picture. You know, we got used to it this way. So they were looking at the Torah, at the, at the Bibles that they were printing, and they're saying, um, how about if we insert some pictures in the books? So they started putting pictures, and there were illustrators or, or great artists that would make pictures for the Bible. Um, one of the famous uh, pictures, um, one of the famous artists that produced pictures for the Bible in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, was Doré, as a French artist who did wonderful, beautiful etchings. And when I was a child, I grew up with a book that has the pictures of uh, Doré relating to stories in the Bible. And um, guess what? Now when you talk to me and you tell me, you talk to me about the story of uh, Samson sitting on, you know, tearing the mouth of a lion, what do I see in my, in my mind? I see, I see the Doré picture uh, etching of uh, uh, Samson sitting on a, on a lion and holding his jaws this way. Okay, that's what comes to my mind. This is how powerful this is because now that picture is embedded in my memory. The 20th century deteriorated this thing even further. Now we have the movie industry getting into the fray. And um, all of us remember, if I say the Ten Commandments, everybody remembers uh, Charleston Heston standing on a rock and holding the Ten Commandments and his hair is, um, you know, uh, flowing in the wind and all of that. That is the picture. It has nothing to do probably with the way it, it happened. But that's the way the movie depicted it. So now when we say uh, Moses, the Ten Commandments, that's what we see, the image of that. So at that point, I don't think there was anything sinister in, in creating that movie. It was just a fun Hollywood thing. It had no agenda particularly. Uh, didn't try to change anything. But we come to our time and we see people 
that have power and have money and have the ability to create things that influence millions of people. Um, for example, uh, Michael Moore making a movie that is very um, directed in, in, its, in its aim to show the, the dark side of President Bush. Or Mel Gibson is making The Passion of the Christ. Or Al Gore is making a movie about the environment. Jimmy Carter is writing a book about Israel that is all skewed. All of these people have an agenda, and they're using the media in order to change your perception of whatever issue they're talking about. So remember, the second commandment was an important commandment 3,500 years ago, and it is an important commandment in our days. The Word of God is what he said then, and it is forever, and it's in the text of the Bible. Movies, sculptures, pictures, books are all fine, but you have to be aware that they can change your perception of what it is that God wanted you to know. I want to thank you for joining us today. Please visit the Center for Biblical Hebrew, centerforbiblicalhebrew.com. Shalom, and see you again. Shalom, and thank you for joining us today in Speaking About Hebrew, a program where you learn amazing things about what God really said. My name is Uri Harel. I was born in Haifa, Israel, and Hebrew is my first language. As a director of the Center for Biblical Hebrew in Phoenix, Arizona, I've seen a tremendous recent increase in interest in the Hebrew language. In this program, I attempted to demonstrate to you how the Bible comes alive when you know the secrets of the Hebrew language. I hope this entertaining discussion will motivate you to learn more about Hebrew and about the Word of God. To do so, I would like to invite you to visit our website at centerforbiblicalhebrew.com center for biblical hebrew dot com thank you shalom and see you next time this program was produced by and for god's learning channel if you enjoy this program we need your support to keep this program on glc please make your checks out to god's learning channel p.o box 61000 midland texas 797-11-1000「Please be sure to designate where your contribution is intended. It is very important to let GLC know which programs you enjoy and support. »